Hello friends, hope you're having a good day. It is absolutely beautiful outside. Uh, beautiful Easter weekend. We're going to talk about the resurrection power today. The resurrection power in our marriages. What about that? What about marriages? Uh, you ever think about that? What, what's happening right now in marriages uh, are around the world? Right now, marriage, I, I was telling a friend of mine a little earlier, I said, you know, we have, we have, we have people, more people getting divorces than we do getting married. I mean, over 50% of the marriages just don't last. They just, they end up bankrupt and they split up. And, and so, you know, that, that's, uh, that has got to be a huge important topic right now uh, because God cares about marriage. So I want to start out with the question, why I do? Why I do? Why, why do we say I do? It's because of Him. It's because of Him and what He did. It's about what Jesus Christ did. So let's have a little prayer and then we're going to dig into the Word of God. Father in heaven, we thank you that you loved us so much that, uh, that you have created something special as marriage. Today, Lord, as we dig into marriage and we, and we, and we, we look at Easter, this Easter weekend and what it means, Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So why I do? Because God loves a wedding. In fact, weddings were his ideal. He's the one that started the very first wedding back in creation week. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Remember, after Jesus, uh, Genesis 1, Jesus was busy. He was busy creating this beautiful earth that we got around us. I can't imagine when I look at a, a beautiful flower or, or, or a bird or look at the blue skies. God created that, and He created it out of nothing. So He had it. He had all this beautiful beauty in inside His heart and inside His head, and He just spoke it out in six days. He just breathtaking, beautiful creating, and then the Lord knelt down. And in, in, uh, in uh, Genesis chapter two, verse seven, the Bible says, "And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became." A living being. Wow. Now, friends, I know that God was just full of joy when this happened. You know how I know? Because I've got four boys. And, and, and just the, the sight of my boys being born, it just would just flood in my heart with joy. And I've got three grandchildren. And, and when I look at them, uh, the, just joy just radiates, just overflows from me. You know where I get this? I get it from God. We're created in His image. And, and these kind of attributes, they come from God. So joy, I know, I just know that God was full of joy as He, as he, as he knelt down and He just created, molded and shaped uh, Adam uh, into His own, own image there. You know, it's amazing. But something was wrong. You know, all week long, all through Genesis chapter 1, after God created everything, did you notice what He would say? He would say, and it was good. And it was good. And it was good. Over and over and over, you see, everything God made was good. But then, all of a sudden, for the first time in the Bible, the Bible says something strange. And God said, it is not good. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Friends, right here, God is saying, it's not good that man be alone. In verse 21, the Creator then, you could just picture this, tenderly He caused a deep sleep uh, to, to, to fall over Adam. And, and then He performed the very first surgery uh, in, the, in the whole history of the world. And, and, he, and He brought forth the first woman from part of Adam's own body. Wow. You know, I could, I could, I could just imagine Adam waking up you know, from his surgery, and, and there she was. The most beautiful thing that he'd ever laid eyes on. I'm thinking he was probably going, whoa, man. <laughs> In other words, he, he named everything. He, he named her woman. And, and I, I'm thinking that he was probably tingling from the top of his head to the tip of his toes as he looked at Eve. Now, picture this in verse 22. God, the divine heavenly Father, He presented the woman to Adam. And in so doing, what we have here is, is he, he gave away his daughter. 
and, and then conducted the very first wedding ceremony. Have you ever got that picture out of the Bible? That's exactly what happened here. Verse 23, overwhelmed with emotion, Adam, I could just imagine, he grabbed her up, uh, he grabbed his new bride up, and, and he uttered the very first wedding vows. Fam. In verse 23, Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out a man. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? And just in case, uh, and I've heard it and you have too, somebody would say, well, that was just Old Testament stuff. You know, God, I don't know that God's that interested in marriage now. Uh, just in case, Jesus, listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 10 and verse 6 through 9. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So, why, why, why is, is uh, marriage so important to God? Why, why is that? I mean, what, what's his reason behind marriage? I want to dig into that a little bit deeper here. Does, does God know something that perhaps we don't know? Could that be it? Let, let, let me just... From me, from just little old me point of view here, um, I want to just say it plainly. We need each other. We do. We need each other. I, I don't even want to try to live in my life apart from Cindy. I love her so much. We really are one flesh. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, last night, she, she's out speaking right now to, to a group of ladies in, in, for the, uh, in, around Nashville, Tennessee. And I didn't, she wasn't beside me last night. And I couldn't even go to sleep good. I mean, I went to sleep, but it wasn't good sleep. I mean, I need her in my life. I really do, you know. And uh, um, so I tell her all the time, I said, Honey, you can leave me if you want, but I'm walking right out that door with you. I said, Just give me time to pack my bags. So, and that's the truth. I mean, I just got to have her. Now, I want to read something to you. Uh, listen to this, this scripture in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 11. Now, I'm reading from the contemporary English version this time because I like the way it translates it. Listen to this. As far as the Lord is concerned, men and women need each other. Now, I love that. I love the way it sounds. Let me repeat this. As far as the Lord is concerned... Men and women need each other. So God created man. God created woman. But he said it's not good that they, that they be alone. He created marriage so that they could be one flesh. And that's exactly what the Bible says. So friends, we need each other. We need each other to deal with life. Life is tough. Let me tell you what. It, it, it's just tough out there. You know, listen, listen to what the world's smartest man said. Uh, this is Ecclesiastes chapter 4 in verse 9. I'm going to read through verse 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. Listen to this. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. For, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. And I amen that. Yeah, I told Cindy, I said, we don't need an electric blanket. We just snuggle up beside each other. <laughs> so anyway, but, but how can one be warm alone? Though one may be um, overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And, and a three-four cord is not quickly broken. Wow. Now, let me just say this. I couldn't imagine going through like a health crisis, for example, without Cindy, without just being there to support me or me to support her. I couldn't imagine losing a very close loved one. That would just be terrible. You know, if I would need somebody. She would need somebody to, to just lean on. And uh, what about financial? We've already been, Cindy and I have already been through a financial crisis together, and it was tough. But we just, we, just, we just bound up each other and became one flesh, and, and we just got through it. Now, I'm pretty sure now, looking back on it, it was because of her prayers, because at that time, I didn't really know the Lord, but she did. And, and I know that her prayers sustained us and got us through. 
And we just, we just made it. We, and now looking back, all these things that we've been through, it's made us stronger. As we went through storms in life together, we know that we can depend on each other. And one of the things I got going for me is, is, is I haven't always been a pastor. I used to be a heathen. And uh, as bad as you could get, probably. And, uh, and, and she stuck in there with me. So I know that no matter what we're going through, I can't run her off now either. Because if she stuck through me through the hard time, I know she's going to stick with me now. And so it's just so much better, so much sweeter when, 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 when you do it God's, God's way. Now, another reason that God created uh, marriage is He created marriage for His way of filling the earth, populating the earth. It was His way of, of uh, just filling the earth with the human race. Listen to this in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. Then God blessed them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So picture this in your mind. It's God's plan that He would allow man uh, uh, through marriage to, uh, to procreate or populate the, the earth. Now think about that. To populate, that was His plan there. Now, He didn't have to do it that way, right? Because He's God. He could have he populated the earth on His own. He could have did that. Uh, but, but He didn't do it that way. He didn't. He wanted, he wanted us to experience something of the joy of creation. Now you think about that. You know, I was talking about our babies a while ago and the joy. Think about the joy that it, that it is it, when I look at my grandson and, 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 I, and I say, he come out of my loins. Yeah, he did that. You know, think about that. You know, it, what a blessing that is. And I'll tell you something else to think about this. Um, God let us be part of all this. There's something a lot bigger going on than what we can, that's on the surface, I can tell you. And so it was God's plan that, that we would, that as families, as we create, what does our children do? Does our, does our children watch us? I was sharing today that uh, I went by to visit my grandson yesterday, and he can't talk yet. Uh, but he can make noises, and I would go, eh, 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 and, and, and he would go, eh, eh, eh. He, he, he would mimic me. See, our children do that. They watch, they watch us. Uh, yeah, I, I say this all the time. Our children, it's, it's a lot, it's, they, 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 they believe what we do a lot more than, than what we say, because what we say has a lot more to do than what we believe, than what we say we believe. In other words, action speaks. See, as, as parents, what we need to be doing is we need to be training our children up to be good, good young men and women, you know, so that they can go out in the world. See, that's really God's plan. His, his plan is so much better. You know, think about this right here. Marriage, the, 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 the marriage family forms the marriage family. God's plan forms the very foundation of society. And that's God's plan there, you know. It's God's plan that, that godly parents will produce godly children. Are you following me, what I'm talking about here? God, God, see, godly parents, what God's plan is, is for godly parents to instill, uh, to teach, to model, to train their young children to be uh, with a- attitudes and skills necessary, useful in being good, productive Young men and women as they grow up in society. Now that's that's been God's plan from the very beginning here. You know, teaching them to to love. You know, love is the option of selfishness. You know, take for example when a child is born, I guess probably the most selfish creature on planet Earth is a baby. When they're born, they but they learn as they as they grow up in a family, they learn not to be so selfish that the world really don't rotate just around them. You know, and it's important to learn these kind of things. And I believe that, that the marriage family was God's like laboratory uh, uh, to, to train people up how to be more loving and less selfish, maybe more caring toward others, sharing toward others, helping others, see. And so that's, that's been God's plan from the very beginning. And I want to say this. It's probably good for mom and dad too. You know, because it don't take very long before you realize when you get married, 
that, that you know what? There's got to be some give and take on everything because even mama don't see things eye to eye with daddy every day. And so you learn. We, we learn from this. And this was all part of God's plans. So you've heard those saying, as the family goes, so does society. And, I, and I'm not going to spend any time on it, but do you know what's happening to the marriages right now? You know what's happening. I mean, what now it's hard to even define what a marriage is. For instance, God's, God in, in His instruction book tells us the definition of a true marriage. But now we see all kind of uh, uh, definitions for marriages. We see all kind of split homes. Marriage is not important anymore. You know, uh, what is marriage anymore? What do you see happening in society right now? Friends, this is so true. Yeah. So we all know this. Every one of us know this, that, that, it, that it's just so much better when a child go, grows up in a stable Christian home. I mean, we know that. There's been all kinds of studies on that uh, done and everything. We have statistics that show if children grow up without two parents, without a mom and a dad, there, there's a lot of increased risk. Like there's an increased risk, first off, that, they, that they're, they're going to be failures at school. You know, because their, their mindset is just not going to be right. It's going to be a lot of problems going on there. Uh, they're, they're, they're a lot less likely to graduate from a college or some kind of trade school so they could go out and have a trade. Uh, they're more likely, studies have shown that they're more likely to get involved in drug and alcohol and everything like that. Gang related also, uh, especially gang related in your larger cities. Uh, when they don't have that father figure and everything, they don't grow up with that. They need something like that. And a lot of times the gangs kind of kind of take that place in their life. So they get sucked right into this game because all of a sudden they have that structure and support that they that they innerly they, they need. And, and everything. Um, also a big study that I think is really, really, should be really important right now because I'm seeing a lot of it. They're, they're a lot more likely to commit suicide. They are a lot more likely to have depression. Right now, uh, like suicide rates and depression is gone sky high. And, and this would only contribute to it, the studies show. So, uh, uh, and also when, when, when a, a young child is not raised in a, in a home, a stable home with a mom and dad, they're more likely to, to, uh, to have premarital sex and, and start uh, uh, and have broken homes. So all these are studies. These are just facts, friends. This is not me sharing this. I'm just sharing the facts that, that other people have come up with. So, now, I want to dig into something that's probably my favorite part of this message that God's laid on my heart. How does all this fit into Easter? Now, really, think about that. How does this fit into Easter? Easter is really important right now, right? You know, Easter, Easter, it, what is Easter? Easter is a time that we remember that we've got a God that's grace is bigger than our sin. That we've got a God that, that loves us and cares about us. It's a time that, of joyful celebration uh, of the gospel, the good news, that we have a crucified, risen Savior, uh, and that we are His bride. Do you know that? It, it, I want you to think about this. And, and if you've not ever, if you have not ever noticed it, as you study the Bible, and I hope you do on a regular basis, uh, because that's where the power is at, friends. Uh, you'll notice that that you you see this general theme about marriage in relationship all throughout the Bible. It's all throughout the Bible. You see this, and so that's the reason I, I kind of say the best for life here. So Easter. Easter is all about the enormous price that God has paid to secure us, the bride, we're the bride, the bride of Christ, the church is, for His Son, the groom. Right, that's right. So I want to explain this. Just follow along with me. This really gets good here, friends, if you've not heard it before. So in your traditional first century wedding, what would happen is the father would arrange a bride for his son. Now I kind of like that. I, I've got, I've got, uh, I've got. Let's see, I've got a couple boys right now that that are not married, and I think I could probably do a really good job finding them a woman. I'm pretty sure I could, even if I had to pay for it. <laughs> I had to, but anyway, that was a tradition back then. The father would arrange a bride for his son. So he said, "Come on, son, I'm gonna find you a bride." And and what he would do when he find this found this bride, he would pay a predetermined bridal price. We'll, we'll call it that. 
All right, and after he did that, what they would do is they would seal this covenant, this marriage covenant with the other families, and they would both share and, and, and toast kind of with a, a cup of what I would call new wine. They, they, they would do that. Now, after that happened, the son would leave. The son would leave and he would return to his father's house to make, a, uh, to make arrangements, to build that little girl a mansion. Right. And, and most of the time it was right on the side of the dad's house. Uh, and so I'm sure that the, that the, they, well, that was just the way to do it back then. But anyway, and while, the, but while they were gone, while they were gone, what did the bride do? The bride would consecrate herself and, uh, uh, in, in eager anticipation. She would just totally, her whole life revolved around preparation for her marriage because for her, for, for her groom. That she, for her, for her wedding mate. I mean, that's that was her whole life. She would consecrate herself with eager anticipation for his final return, which she didn't know when. She didn't know exactly when that was going to be. So she had to live in a sense of expectation, waiting on the groom to return. So now here's where it gets good. This is where Easter ties in. It follow along with me. So, so God the Father, take this picture now. Let's get in the Bible. So God the Father. Right? God the Father has sent Jesus the Son to secure His bride. The church. Right? Alright? John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave what was the ransom? What was the purchase price? The bridal price? He gave His only begotten Son. He gave. Wow! You know, a huge price was made. A huge price was, was made by the Father uh, to secure the bride. But remember right before, right before Calvary what Jesus did? Remember the upper room when Jesus went in the upper room? Remember what He did? Remember the cup? Remember the cup and the wine that He drank with the disciples? And He says, I drank th this wine. I drank this, but I will not drink this again till I drink it new. When? In the eternal marriage feast, after Jesus comes back and gets us, right? Amazing, beautiful picture here. So what we have here is we've got the covenant relation. We've got the purchase price has been made. The bridal price has been made. It's been a huge price. Uh, God the Father emptied all heaven. That's how much He loves you, friends. He emptied all heaven for you. He paid. He emptied the treasury. He gave His Son. He gave His Son to save us and, 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 and sacrifice His Son on the cross of Calvary. But praise God, up from the tomb He arose. He arose. He praised God He did. And now we know that He departed to His Father's house. Right? Just like the story went. He, prepared, he departed to His Father's house to prepare a place for the bride, which is us, the church, to live. Now you know this. See if you tie this scripture in here in John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3. Remember, Jesus is almost ready to go to Calvary. And he makes this statement here to the disciples. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that that where I am, there you may be also. Are you getting this beautiful picture? Learning about marriage? This, this is the marriage story right here. Jesus, Jesus, the groom, is leaving. But He says, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. Isn't that beautiful there? So, let me, let me ask you this. What is the bride supposed to be doing? What are we supposed to be doing right now? Jesus is gone. He's the groom. He's gone to prepare a place for me. And you, what are we supposed to be doing as the bride right now? The bride, right now, the bride of Christ, which is us, the church, what are we doing? We're eagerly waiting. We're eagerly, eagerly waiting for His return. And what should we be doing right now? We should be consecrating ourselves entirely to Him. What's on our mind is the same thing that, sh that what, what was on that, that young bride's mind while she was waiting on the groom. All she was concerned about. The only thing that was on her mind was, was her was her mate coming back. Was her the groom coming back. That should be what's on our thoughts right now. We should be... Friends, this is a time to get serious about our relationship with God. It really is. 
Right now, we need to be consecrating ourselves. We need to be purifying ourselves uh, for the day when He will return and, and we will be with Him forever. Praise God. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That is a beautiful picture right there. Um, so I want, I, want to, I want to end with this right here, with this thought. I believe that the primary reason that God created marriage was to give us a symbol, a symbol, a picture of, our, of what our relationship to Christ should be like in our need, our need right now, friends, to be preparing for Jesus Christ's soon return. That, that's, that's right. I believe that marriage is, is given to us to give us a picture, a picture of, of, of what our relationship, it's, it's a laboratory, it's a place to grow and to, to learn to be more Christ-like because instead of being selfish, I'm, I'm more loving and more caring and I put my wife and my family first. Friends, these are all elements that teach us, that are shaping us and molding us into the relationship that God wants to have with us. I mean, you remember in Matthew chapter 25, right, be- right, right before Jesus was, 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 was going to be, you know, to go up to heaven, he gave the story about the, the ten virgins. The ten, this, was a, this was a marital a marriage a covenant, that just like we are been talking about today, the ten virgins, they're waiting, they're waiting on the groom to come by. They represent us. They represent the church. But friends, sadly, G- this is Jesus telling us, sadly, five out of the ten of the ten virgins did not have oil in their lamp. And you know what Jesus told them? He says, I don't even know you. I don't even know you. Friends, we don't want that to be us. Right now, what we need to be doing is we need to be consecrating our life to God. Now, friends, I want to make it really clear. This is not anything that you can do on your part other than seeking God. You can't cleanse yourself. You can't sanctify yourself. But you can turn from the world and turn to Jesus. And when you do that, when you do that, friends, it's God that does the work in you. When you turn to Him, when you reach out to Him, by beholding Him, we become changed into His likeness, friends. So now is the time to be crying out to God, God, search my heart. You know, I, I, I'm not a good person, but I want, to be, I want to be more like you. I can't do it on my own, but you can do it. The blood of Jesus, the, the, friends, the resurrection power is what we need in our life individually, and it's what we need in our life corporately as a church and in our marriages uh, God wants to give you the resurrection power to work miracles in your life personally and in, in your marriage. Now, see, the, the, the marriage is an object lesson of how much God loves you. He loves you. He wants you to wrap your mind around that, that He loves you. He's head over heels madly in love with you, friends. He loves you. You can't stop Him from, from loving you. He's head over heels madly in love with you. And it's also an object lesson of how we are to love each other as marriages. You know, we, we, need to, we need to be better husbands. We need to be better wives. We need to look for ways that, that we can treat each other like we want them to treat us. We need to, we need to be quick to, 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 to be the one to ask forgiveness. We need to be quick to the one to say, can I help you? We need to, we, and God will help us do that. He will empower us to do that. That resurrection power. Friends, do you want the resurre- resurrection power of God working in your life and in your marriage? I want you to listen to this life scripture I'm going to share with you. It's found in Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 25 through 33. Listen to this closely here. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he, may, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Wow. Husbands, love your wives. That's love. Now, that's God's definition of loving your wife. That you would do, that you would, that you would die for her. Friends, that's called sacrificial love. That's selfless love. That's putting your spouse first above your needs. 
Friends, that's what God says, do that. And if you do that, if you make the attempt to do that, He will empower you through the resurrection power to do it. It won't be strength that you've got. You'll be shocked at where you're getting the strength to do this. But if you put her first, if you love her above your own needs, God is saying, I will bless you. Let's go on. So husbands, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. See, he's telling us here, the whole reason, the whole reason for a marriage, the whole idea about marriage is to teach us God's love for the church. Friends, marriage is so important. It's, that's the reason we've got to defend marriage. That's the reason we've got to protect marriage. And that's the reason we have got to do anything we can to make sure our marriage makes it. We've got to determine to just stick. I'm going to do it. And friends, when, when you run out of power to do it yourself, which won't be very long, turn to God. He's going to bless marriages. He's going to empower marriages. He's going to do everything that, that, that He can to bless your marriage. But you've got to turn to Him. You've got to turn to Him. Uh, For this reason, a man shall leave his wife, and, uh, father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, friends, I said a whole lot there. What I'd recommend, this is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 33. Go back over and read that. Read that again slowly. Just let it sink in what God is trying to tell you right here. Friends, I want you to know, God, think of, I don't know where you stand right now in your own marriage or your own relationship uh, that that you stand right now. But, but I want to make a point here in closing that God used the death and the resurrection of His Son to restore our relationship with Him. He did that. He used the death and in the, in the resurrection of His Son. That's how much it costs. That's how much it's worth to God to bring you into the fold. That's how much God loves you, friends. He loves you that much. So you might be right now, you might be thinking, I don't know. I don't see any hope in our marriage. It's just I just see I don't see any hope, uh, and and I just, I'm having some doubts that our marriage could even be restored. Friends, I want you to remember something here. Talking about the Easter story, the Easter story, the Easter story isn't one of death and defeat. No, friends, not at all. The Easter story is is about overcoming death in victory, overcoming death. In victory. With God, your marriage story can be one of victory as well. I want to challenge you, friends. Give your marriage to God. If you want the, you, if you want the best life there is, give your marriage to God. If you want the best life there is, you and your spouse start praying together. Start praying together. Just be honest. Be honest. Say, Lord, um, you know, Lord, uh, we... we we, we don't really know how to work this out. We're up against a wall. Go ahead and be honest with me. I'm up against a wall here. It just don't seem like things are getting any better at all. But, but we're going to believe that you believe that you, can, that you can turn our marriage around and turn it into good. We're gonna, that's going to be our starting point. And that's, that's my challenge to you. That's not asking too much there. Because I'm sure whatever that wall is that's been there for so long... Um, that that uh, that pink elephant in the room, whatever it is, it's been there so long. Maybe maybe you're powerless, and yes, you are. But do you believe God believes He can take care of that? Yes, He can. Allow God to bring the resurrection power into your marriage. He will bless your marriage. He's the one that started marriages. He's the one that will keep marriages going. If you put a family that prays together stays together, start carrying everything to God in prayer. Do that every morning. Get up and have a prayer together. Cindy and I, every single morning, before our feet hit the ground, we have a prayer together. We ask God into our life. We, we, we ask that God would be that third person in our relationship. If you keep God 
that third person in the relationship. That it's just not you and your spouse, but it's you and your spouse and God. Friends, you will live a victorious life. And not only that, you will be an example to all the world around you. Friends, I've heard, I pray that you've heard this. I believe that God has people watching right now that need to hear this message. God wants to turn your marriage around. And He wants to use you as a light to the whole world of what God can do when, when He's allowed to come into the very center and be that third person in the marriage. Let me pray for you, friends. Father in heaven, you are a good God. And I'm inviting you right now uh, to continue being Lord of Cindy and our, and our marriage. But not only ours, but everyone that's watching or, or that's going to watch. I pray right now, Lord, that, you, that you, would, you would come in the very center of their relationship and that you would, from that point on, guide them and direct them and bless them. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, friends. Jesus loves you. Get outside and enjoy some of this sunshine out there. It's beautiful. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.